tonight. Um, back again to the close of another, of another Sunday. Um, and like I said this morning, I love Christmas music. So just knowing that we're going to, this is Christmas time, we get to sing um, Christmas carols as we come. I, I'm always excited to come and, and worship and sing. pray that you are as well. Um, let's, let's begin this evening um, with the word of prayer. Lord God, we are so thankful for all that you do for us. Thank you that you sent your son to save us, that you have redeemed us by um, your blood. We come tonight to worship you, Lord, uh, as we remember back to the time that you left heaven to clothe yourself in humanity and to walk among us, to live in humility and teach us what it was like to, um, to serve. Help us to recognize the pattern you left for us and to, for us to follow it with faithfulness. Thank you for your love and for all that you do for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. into this song, we'll go right over into Silent Night.
Thank you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us this opportunity, Lord, to come to your house and to worship. We thank you, Lord, for the desire to worship, for loving us, Father, when we didn't have enough sense to even seek your face. And Lord, as we have gathered to worship tonight, Lord, we are reminded that there are so many out there, Lord, who do not desire to worship. And so our heart turns to them, Lord, and pleads and begs for mercy for them, Father. And Lord, be with us. <clears throat> Help us. Help us help me, Lord, to live before them righteously. To show in our lives, Lord, the love you have shown us. To be a star, God, that leads men to Christ. We pray, Lord, for that mercy on our countrymen, our neighbors, our friends, our family. Convict their hearts, God. Convict our hearts. And Lord, we have met to worship you tonight, Lord, to uplift your name. And God, I, I know that the devil, Lord, covets our focus, covets our minds, and Lord, and so we'll give everything into our minds. God, help us to not be distracted, to focus on your word, to learn from it. Lord, we uplift our pastor as he is about to break the bread of life. God, give him the words we need to hear to strengthen us, to break our hearts if needed, that we would have the courage to repent and to live before you honestly and uprightly so that your name is magnified and glorified among men. And God, we bring big things before you, but it's okay because you're a bigger God. And there are no better hands to place them in. In Christ's name we beg. Amen. If we'll turn with me to Second Thessal or to First Thessalonians chapter three. First Thessalonians chapter three. Um, if you remember from a month ago when we first did the outline, we broke. We said this book is broken into two halves. The first half is talking about how Paul remembers, and then starting in chapter four, um, we're going to enter into a time where Paul exhorts. So the first half of this book has been talking us and encouraging us um, about what ministry looks like. We've looked at a church that is doing well, what it looks like to start a church, what it looks like to see that a church is growing. And we talked about how um, Paul, this was a church that was born out of adversity. 
that in Philippians, he was not, in Philippi, he was not treated well. And he had to hurry and get away. He goes to Thessalonica. He's there for a short period of time. And then, all of a sudden, he's hurried out in a day. He's not there anymore. He had to leave in a hurry. He went to Berea, and the Jews were so upset with him. From, the ones came from Thessalonica. They chased him to Berea to send him on even further. And so, not only did he have to leave the local area, but he even had to leave the region. And so he left his church, a, a new church, that he wasn't ready to leave. And so we've looked about, um, even in that, we've talked about the comfort that we see, that we're not the first in our day who are not able to be with the ones we wish we could be with. Paul talks about in this book over and over, I wanted to be there, I wanted to be there, so much so that in the last message in, in chapter, in the first part of chapter 3, he says, therefore when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to sing, send Timothy to you. He's saying, I, I deeply desire, and I, I, Timothy is needed here, but we also have to know, how are you doing? And so th in tonight, as we look at this, Paul gets to the part of the letter that he talks about the fact that Timothy has returned from Thessalonica. He has a message from the Thessalonians. He's seen them, he's talked to them, and he's come and he's given his report to Paul. And so what, I, what I've entitled this evening is Successful Ministry. Now I'm going to read the, the rest of chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 6, and I'll read down through the end of the chapter. And what I want you to notice is what Paul thinks is important about the ministry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 6. But now that Timothy has come from, to us from you, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through the faith, your faith. And now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now... May our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. Five points I want to make tonight about what successful ministry looks like. And the reason I say it that way is because you can tell that Paul is really excited about the report that he heard. First I want to tell you, tell you some examples of some things he didn't say. He didn't say, Timothy, I just got back and I am so excited that you have a new family life center that's really going to impact your community. He didn't say that. He didn't say, you know, I was really impressed with your brand new screen. It looks like you're really going to have a lot more better worship. He didn't focus on that either. He didn't, he didn't go to any of the things that sometimes we would like to measure success by. He didn't talk about how many new people had come into the church. He didn't talk about even how many different programs the church was offering. He didn't even say how many meals you've given. And none of those things are bad things. All of those things are wonderful ways that we can minister, but they're not the point. And so what I want to look at tonight is, what was the point? What did it look like for Paul to say, we are still giving thanks because of the message? And the first one is, the product of successful ministry. And he mentions two things, I think. The first one is a soundness. And we could go in, we could spend all our time this evening just talking about it, what it means for the church to be sound. I think the way he stated that in verse 6 is he says, But now that Timothy has come from us and has brought to us the good news of your faith and your love. 
As I was thinking about that, 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 as I understand it, that is the soundness of the church. In those two words we have wrapped into it, on the one hand, our theology, what it is we believe, as well as our practice, what it is we're doing. And our theology and our practice had better be overflowing what's in our hearts, which is an increase of faith and an increase of love. So faith and love were displayed in a way that Timothy could come back and say, this church is doing well. This is a successful church. I would love it if there was someone that came to Laurel Bank that hasn't been here in a long time. That when they came in, they would not say, boy, I really like that new screen. That's, that's wonderful. That would not be their primary focus. That they would not say, wow, we've got some new members. That's great. It's good to... Not that that's bad. But that they would say, wow, you know, we've been gone and coming back. It sure looks like you guys have grown in faith and in love. Now, that might look like taking meals on a Saturday. But the point is not the meal. The point is the faith and love that overflow into those things. That's what successful ministry looks like. So the first one was soundness. The second one is affection. Timothy said that they had faith and love, and he also reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us. And I think that affection is broken into two things. One is good memories of when we were together, it's the past, and the other is looking forward to when we're together again. That's the future. I say this, as I looked at this, is because I deeply want our ministry to be successful. And I think it's instructive for us to see the things that Paul thought were important so that we know what's important. Remember, uh, you remember us kindly and you long to see us. They had an affection for the saints, for each other, for Paul. So, that's the product of a successful ministry, soundness and affection. And by the way, I should mention that sometimes when we come to these types of outlines, I feel like I'm looking at an inclusive list. Do these and things will be great. And I don't necessarily see that tonight. These are just things that he brought out. Matter of fact, I think if you were to talk to Paul and you were to say, well, Paul, it looks like you were teaching us that successful ministry needs to be sound and have affection, he'd say, well, those are two. <laughs> But there are others as well. And so just because I'm not mentioning them tonight don't mean they're not important. It just means that Paul didn't mention them specifically at this point. Okay? So, soundness and affection. Verse 7, we see the motivation for working in ministry. For this reason, that's the motivation. Brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. What Paul's saying here is, I'm willing to have a great deal of distress and affliction. And that's okay as long as what? And again, there's two things that he's mentioning. Number one, their faith, which he's already mentioned, but he's bringing it up again. Verse 7, For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Your faith has brought us comfort. That is the motivation that drives us. I can tell you that as a pastor. You know what encourages me the most? When you call me and say, you know, I'm studying the Scripture, and I've got, you know, what, is, what does this mean? Or, you know what, I've really decided this is important. This is something I think we ought to do. Or, you know, I've made a decision based off of studying Scripture that this is the way I'm going to live my life. That is immensely encouraging. And not just as a pastor, but as a member of the church. I don't know if you were encouraged this morning, 
But I was deeply encouraged by listening to Wayne and Debbie talk about what's happened this week in their life and how they walked through it. Why? Because he's demonstrating his faith. It's working its way out. And it comforts us. Even if there's affliction and distress that we say, praise God for what he is doing. So that's the first one is faith. And the second one is steadfastness. Verse 8, for now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Paul's saying my, our ministry, the effort that we put in. And again, he doesn't go into all the details with them, but we know this is the town where Jason was beat. This is the town where we had to hurry Paul out at night. We had to be careful here because this was a dangerous place, but it was worth it because you are standing under the load. This has been the case a lot over the pandemic that I'll talk to someone that I've not been able to talk to in a long time. And for the sake of not embarrassing, I won't call them out by name, but there have been several people that have not been here in a pretty good while, but for whatever reason, either I call them or they call me, which by the way, it is okay to call me, okay? If you're concerned that I'm busy, don't worry. I know how to not answer. I, I'm a... I, I, I really will just not answer if it's at a bad time, and I'll call you back when I can. Um, I hope you're not offended by that. It, it should be a comfort to you to know that you're really not going to interrupt me if you call me. I just won't answer if I can't talk right now, and, and I'll call you back when I can. Christy, you're laughing. You know that's true, right? <laughs> and sometimes he forgets to call me back. <laughs> and sometimes you have to call me again, and that's okay. I'm, I'm just as human as anybody else. But however it happened that I called them or they called me or somehow we got a chance to talk and they said, we're doing good. This has been hard. We miss everyone, but we're making it. That conversation, oh my goodness, the load it lifts for me to know that they are standing firm in the faith. This is a hard time. And it is very easy for people to slip. And so to hear that those that are following Christ are continuing to follow Christ is an encouragement. And it was to Paul. This is motivation. I can handle the distress and the affliction because I've heard that you are standing strong in the faith and because I've heard that you are remaining steadfast. Thirdly, I think we see the fruit of successful ministry in our own hearts. Verse 9, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? And it seems like with each of these, these are in twos. So there's two again here. Number one, we see thanksgiving. Have you ever been in that place where you got one of those scary phone calls? And then just a little while later, you get a phone call saying, everything's okay. Doesn't it make you want to drop on your knees and thank God for what he's done? And I get that sense as I read this, that what Paul is saying is, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? He's saying, when I heard from Timothy that you're doing good, it overwhelmed me. How can I even begin to thank God? I hope there have been times in your life that you've been overwhelmed with thankfulness. I know it has happened in mine. And Paul says, that happened in me because I saw that you are growing in faith, that you're sound and you have affection, that the ministry is, is, is working, that you are remaining steadfast. So the first one is thanksgiving. The second fruit in our heart that we see here is joy. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Again, the longer I'm a Christian, 
I feel like the more joy I feel when I watch people be baptized. This morning and last Sunday morning and now several months ago, when you watch a young person commit their life to the Lord, it's hard for me after they come up out of the water and they walk up and I have to talk even to have words because my heart is just overflowing with, with thankfulness that leads into joy for what it is that they have done and what it is God is doing. Matter of fact, I think that's what could be misidentified as pride when we watch our, our children worship the Lord. When we watch our not just our children, but our, our young adults choose to worship the Lord. And I know this is the case. I know that when we have mornings like this morning, when young people are giving their gifts back to the Lord to worship, that there's almost a bursting of your heart. I, I'm not sure it's pride. I think it might be joy that you are so happy that they are following God. Paul says... How can we even begin to thank God for the joy that is in our hearts because we found out that you have faith and that you have affection for us? But notice it doesn't lead to complacency. Paul doesn't look at his big map with green, yellow, and red, and their Thessalonians, the Thessalonians were in red, and hears back from them, he says, oh good, they're safe. Let's take out the red and put in the green. They're good. We don't have to think about them for another year. Then we'll check back in. That's not what, ha what, he, what he says. What he says is that his prayer has been continuous, and it continues to be continuous. I'm going to start again in verse 9. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. What he doesn't say is, it is so wonderful that you have arrived. We'll check mark you and put you in the full grown church category and we'll treat you different. Instead, he says, we are so thankful, we're so filled with joy, and we are continually, continuing to pray for you night and day. Well, what's he praying for? Well, one thing is meeting together. So this is the continuation of successful ministry. And, and the first one ought to be obvious, it's prayer. And not just a little prayer, but consistent, earnest prayer time-consuming prayer, day and night continually. That's not a little effort. That's a lot of effort. Paul thinks that if we're going to watch this church strive, if we're going to watch this ministry continue to be successful, we need to continue to be on our face before God about it. What is he praying for? He's praying for meeting together. That we may see you face to face. There is something unique about having a chance to be together. <laughs> Jana's parents have gone through a season in their life where they were doing a lot of effort taking care of their parents for several years. Um, they had, Jana had a grandmother that they went to see often and a grandfather, different sides of the family that lived somewhere else that they had to see often. And every once in a while, I would be talking to Jana's dad. It didn't happen a lot, but they would not be doing well. And one of the things da Jana's dad would say would be, well, I'll let you know when I can get eyes on her or eyes on him, that phrase. What does it mean? That there's only so much we can tell over the phone. So we're going to go down, and once we get there face to face and have a chance, and it's amazing how fast it can happen, that we can get a better sense of what's going on. I can tell you that's true with taking care of family members. I can tell you it's true as a professor. 
that I've had long back and forth emails with students and finally say, well, can we just meet? And it seems like in 10 minutes we can do what it would have taken two hours by email, stretched over four days, because it never happens quickly. It's also happened in the church when there's been a disagreement or uh, 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 the concern that there's been a disagreement. And to say, you know what, why don't we, why don't we just get together and, and talk for a minute? And what Paul is saying, I think, is that I know you're doing well, but it is my deep and earnest prayer that we have a chance to see each other face to face again. And when he gets there, he has a purpose for why he wants to be with them face to face. Verse 10, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. There he is talking about faith again. Do you get that successful ministry hinges on faith? That's what it's about. God's people ought to be people of faith, working its way out in their lives. And what Paul says is, I want to supply what is lacking in your faith. That sounds like teaching to me. But as I thought about it, I'm not sure that it was just, I have a sermon series that I've been composing for the last three months that you deeply need to hear. I think it was also, and I think this is evidenced by the book, an example of Paul walking before them. The way I wrote it was both words and walk. That what he wanted to do is he wanted to be with them faith, face to face to supply what is lacking in their faith, and that would happen not only with what he said, but also with what he did. Not, all, not only with his words, but also with his walk. And all of it was to increase their faith. And then as we finish this chapter, there's no reason for us to be talking about successful ministry without realizing why and how it's successful. And that is the power of God. <laughs> that it's not in our own strength, it's in God's strength. And so what we see next in verse 11 through 13, is Paul's prayer. He's been praying that he can be with them face to face, but now he turns almost to a benediction. I don't do this much. I'd like to do it more. But there are times when God's people are blessed. And it could be the pastor, but it really could be anyone. And it typically looks like this, where they, they're almost raising their hand. If, if you were close enough, I'd put my arm around you and give you a hug. And it starts off with, now may God bless you. That's the extent of what it looks like. And that's what Paul's doing. He's switching now to praying to God for their sake, so that they can hear his prayer. Verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. I'm going to stop there, although the, the, it continues. The first thing he asks is to direct our way to you. Notice he has already said, when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to you. When Timothy came back, how can we even begin to thank God for the joy that we have because we see that your faith is there? And then he says, and you know how we're continually praying that one day we're able to see you face to face. And now he continues to tell us what that looks like. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Again, this we could spend quite a bit of time mulling over why, God, why Paul used these titles for God. I want to make a suggestion for you in your prayer life that you learn to refer to God with his different names. What I mean by that is that we all are creatures of habit. 
I almost always begin my prayer with one of the kids. Y'all tell me. What, what's, when I start a prayer, what do I normally say? Can you imagine me praying? I hope you can. <laughs> it's a test. That's right. No? No? Okay. I'll open it up. What do you think? Lord? Yeah. I have been working on referring to God as my Father in my prayers. As a young person, I didn't. I almost always started all of my prayers with, Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for what you're doing. Now, what does that mean? It means that when I come to God, I recognize that He is my Master. And I'm referring to Him as my Lord. There are other people I know that almost always begin their prayer with Father. What does that show me? It shows me that when they come to God, they recognize that He is the one who loves them and takes care of them, that is protecting them. There is a significance to the name. And so what Paul is teaching us, I think, even as we just have a a chance to hear just a portion of his prayer life, is that he's actually referring to God in different ways as he's asking for his request. God, I want to be with them, our Father and our God. You both love me and you're in control. You're the one who can get me from here to there. And Jesus, our Lord... Jesus is our Savior. You have both saved me and you guide me. So God, you're in charge of all things. Father, you love me. Jesus, you're my Savior. And Lord, I will follow you. That's a chance for us to actually communicate to our God very quickly. So I would encourage you to expand your vocabulary for the words that you refer to God as you pray. He says, May our God and Father and Jesus our Lord direct us to you. So God's part is number one, He's the one who brings us together. Man, in this pandemic, we ought to maybe even memorize this prayer. <laughs> There are so many in our church that this is my earnest prayer. That may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. That's the first one, is that may God direct us to each other. The second one is, there's no other way for me to shorten it. It's it's so concise. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. Two things, increase and abound in love for one another and for all. Paul was saying, I want to come because I want to build your faith. And God, please help their their love to abound and increase. And I am solidly convinced on the evidence of the New Testament church that our love for the world begins at home with our love for each other. If you want to see a church who deeply loves the world, you will find a church who deeply loves each other. And love is one of those things that the more we love each other, it's like a muscle. (laughs) The more we love each other, the more capacity we have to, number one, love each other and also love the world. So his prayer is, may God direct our way together. May God increase and abound. May may God make you increase and abound in love. And then finally this evening, 
Verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with his saints, with all his saints. The third prayer that he has here is that your hearts, the hearts of the Thessalonians, would be established in holiness. It's a strong command. It's a strong prayer. That they would be, their hearts would be blameless. And they would be ready for the coming of Jesus. Tonight's sermon, for me at least, has been a reminder of what it looks like to be praying for the church. I'm praying for us to be together. I want to do all that I can to help you grow in the faith. I know I need to be praying that God will help you to abound in love, and increase. And that I need to be praying, as you need to be praying, that we as a church have our hearts established blamelessly in the holiness of God. Now, this is not saying that Paul is saying, listen, you need to sin no more. Matter of fact, the whole point is that he didn't say, you need to do this. He says, I am praying that God will do this in you. In Sunday school this morning, we were talking about, um, we're in um, Hebrews chapter 8, and we were talking about the difference between knowing God's Word, having the laws in our mind and knowing them, and what God promised He would do, and that is to take it from just knowing it to writing it on our hearts. There's a contrast between just knowing and having them in our hearts. And if I understand what this is saying, is that is the holiness that God requires of us is not knowing the laws and obeying them because they're the laws and that's what we have to do. But instead, our hearts are established, that these are written in us, in our soul. By the way, that is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Not that it happens one day and you wake up and all of a sudden it's all fixed, but the, the, the act of becoming sanctified, of God making us more into the image of His Son, is, is Him taking our broken heart of stone, replacing it with a heart of flesh, and in that heart of flesh, writing His laws in our hearts. We're about to move into Paul moving from remembering the church and seeing its success to be very strong in exhorting, now do this. But understand that the do this is hinging on the fact that Paul has been spending his time praying that they would grow in love, that God would establish them blamely, uh, would establish um, their... Um, hearts blamelessly. There we go. So, as we, as we finish tonight, finish thinking about, about the church and what it looks like for successful ministry, we had the privilege yesterday, and it is a huge privilege, to take part in showing love to our church and to people that are not in our church. And it was wonderful. And we were talking about doing it again. I look forward to doing it again. I think it's something we should do. Two weeks ago, we had a drive through I think it was just two weeks ago, where people came and we gave them food that way. And we took down their prayer requests, prayed with them. And that was good. We showed love to the church and we showed love to the community around us. We're in the process of having our Lottie Moon offering where we are giving to 
the mission that's going on around the world. Why? Because we love them and we want them to succeed in sharing the gospel with those in the far reaches of the earth. All those are good. But success is never the program. Success is the faith that, and love that is built because of the program. Doesn't mean the programs are bad, but it's just the process so that people can grow. And again, this is a good reminder for us as a church not to be distracted and instead stay focused on what Paul thought was important. Let's pray, and then we'll stand and sing. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and your love for us. Lord, we thank you that even as Paul, these so many years ago, prayed for a young church, that he was concerned about where the, whether they were established, that you had been working in their lives, drawing them to yourself, helping them to grow. Lord, I pray that we would have minds and hearts that see past the superficial and can see what it is you're actually doing. And Lord God, it is our earnest prayer that just like Paul, that our church would grow in faith, that our love would abound more and more. And Lord, that we would be looking forward and longing for your return when we as the saints of God will be together with you forever. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's, let's stand and sing. Our word tonight. All right. Brady, will you close us in prayer? Sure. Lord, Father.